morning, Garth. Uh, thanks so much for joining me this morning. I really appreciate it. Um, as we've discussed, we're going to have a conversation as part of Grundy Art Gallery's Collection Conversation Series. And our conversation today is taking place against the backdrop of Grundy Art Gallery's 110th anniversary year. Um, so it was set up in 1911, as you probably know, to show the best art of the day. And it was set up by two local artist brothers, John and Cuthbert Grundy, whose gift of £2,000 and a donation of over 30 artworks um, is the beginnings of the gallery. And during this year, we're going to look at some of the stories behind works that we have in our collection. And I'm absolutely delighted that we're going to be talking with you today about uh, the fact that we've recently agreed, Grundy Art Gallery has recently agreed to acquire a piece of your work into the Grundy Art Gallery collection. And the work's actually hanging behind you, which is great. And I'm also going to share a uh, image of it as well. And I wondered, could you just tell me a bit more about this piece of work? What is the story behind the work? And I know that it's part of a wider project. So if you want to talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so the work that's currently due to be acquired with yourselves, uh, thank you very much, is called Shy Girl Beside the Seaside Campground. Um, quite simply, when looking at it, it's a standard beach towel um, hanging uh, slightly skew if on a bronze powder coated steel bar. And it's relevant to my work in a sense that I'm constantly looking at ways to flirt or cruise relationships between materials in a way that's referential of LGBTQ um, identity as well. And kind of having a playfulness and accepting that those things are slippery. Um, so I like to explore a precariousness to something that is maybe otherwise rigid in terms of abstraction and geometry in the use of stripes and triangles in the composition of this work. Um, the title itself, although sounding slightly um, abstract in its own right and playful and poetic, is quite literally the three colours that the work is kind of um, composed of. Shy Girl being the equilateral triangle that is half hidden behind a stripe in a grey that is referred to as campground and beside the seaside is the the green that runs centrally in the towel. The work follows a nine inch measurement rule as a way of, I guess at the time when the work was being made just before the lockdown, I started to become interested in ways that work is designed digitally at a time when maybe the workspaces weren't accessible. So this was the first example of me about making a collection of works that are digitally composed and then printed on blank canvases, such as a standard beach towel that we're all familiar with when we think about the seaside and places such as the beach or notions of going on holiday for rest or self-care. Um, it is part of a wider collection. There's carrying on the nine inch rule, um, there's nine towels. So the intention is that there would be nine coastal galleries or collections that would each have one of these lovely towels. And then the view is that there would be a future tour of that work as a way to allow me to constantly test the installation elements of my work that are usually around a way of exposing ideas in a much bigger space and inviting audiences to congregate in a space that's having a, a conversation around queer art and queer culture. And I mean, you talked um, and have talked about this work being a continuation of your uh, solo show, Shy Girl at the Grundy Art Gallery uh, last year. Um, I'm just gonna show a couple of images of the uh, exhibition installation. Um, and I just wondered if you want to just talk a bit more about that particular exhibition, which we had, which is almost a year, yeah, a year to the day that we had it in the gallery. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so Shy Girl was a major solo show in my view, in terms of trajectory for myself and the scale of ambition for seeing works happen in galleries. Um, a lot of my work was, has been self-initiated and has traveled across project spaces. So this was really a nice opportunity to take hold of origin for me, um, coming from Blackpool, having family history and heritage in Blackpool, and also looking at some of the parallels between queer history um, and also the seaside coastal histories of how stripes and geometry play a host in the way that motifs sit in seascapes such as Blackpool. So you can quite simply see that the rotunda in the Grundy traditionally would have been a kind of experience for wall hanging or salon hangs and you would walk around and look at paintings perhaps back to back as an audience. 
And I really wanted to take hold of a queer conversation that dealt with the space between. And this was a really wonderful opportunity to have such architecture to play with and play with notions of masking and masquerading in the way that motifs and tropes attached to identity can come together and, and cover up the traditional um, iron and wood banister and railings that were there and cover it with this custom designed striped square. Um, and it allowed me to bring in some of the core attributes of abstraction in, in the simple use of a circle, a square and a triangle. Um, given that the rotunda roof is this circular dome and then the balcony was this kind of offering of a square and then the shape that I'm dealing with constantly around identity and liberation of self is the triangle and the it, use historically and currently in terms of LGBTQ activism. So it just seemed to be a really lovely marriage and it made sense to look at the this blue and white stripe in the way that it brought a reference specific to Blackpool in the 1950s and the use of deck chairs which had the same kind of colour composition, um, as well as the ori origin of Blackpool Football Club in their football strip. So it starts to have a conversation around clothing that is striped, um, as well as the historical use of, you know, references such as the boy in the striped pyjamas and looking at Nazi Germany and prisoner of war camps. So there was such a multi-layering of something that otherwise is a very simple choice to just create a square in a space and let that sit in the space. Um, and this was the first time using the beach towels where we kind of played with three in that space, two very formally placed to kind of mirror the stripes that they're sitting on. So there's this kind of marriage between the relationships of the materials and the aesthetics of them. And then this kind of crushed, almost used beach towel that's offered in there to suggest some bodily performance, perhaps in an otherwise silent or static space. The and thing that I really really enjoyed about about the exhibition was that it created this relationship between the ground floor as we saw in that last slide the ground floor and that first floor that sense of joining of the two spaces and the architectural um intervention i think was so strong so it was a really really stunning show yeah i talk a lot about cruising in my work and that has different connotations based on people's perceptions of I guess what marginalized people do when they try and find their own safe spaces or public spaces where they can communicate um, with each other in different ways around their sexual desires, um, which others may see as deviant behavior as opposed to safe behavior. Um, and I really like the idea that a gallery became a cruising ground in its most innocent and playful way and reminded people that you can look at art as well as each other. Um, it's kind of complicit in the way that we look at things around us. We can't help but bring our own perceptions and judgments onto an object that we're looking at that we're trying to understand as well. So it just felt a really lovely opportunity to explore a gallery as something that's, as an artwork, being congregational, not just sculptural yeah. in that way. So as we sit here, uh, 12th of February, 2021, the Grundy Art Gallery is unfortunately closed as a result of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And as we hear all the time, we're just living through such extraordinary times. I mean, last year with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which saw protests sweep the world. Um, now with many museums, all museums and galleries being closed and lots of the infrastructure that artists use to develop their practice and present their work, that's all come to a halt. Um, and, you know, COVID-19 has created devastation for so many people. I just wondered, if and how this global context impacts on you and your work. It's a really difficult scenario, isn't it? In that undoubtedly there is impact if one cares about what's happening. Um, and I do, and it's really upsetting. And I think it has to be acknowledged and addressed that, you know, white people have changed perceptions of origin so much so that we now teach in a normal way that black people began at the point of slavery. And that just is wrong. Um, it removes any real history or real identity around um, people. And all lives don't matter. And that's the thing that's frustrating. And that's the thing that we have to be allies for and support. And I don't think I'll ever comprehend that level of oppression, but I can empathize with feelings of being othered and marginalized. And I really seek to embody or embed a queer um, focus in my work. 
I think what it did was announce a decision in me as an artist to use the word queer and not just hide that word. You know, coding and ideas within queer culture can be embedded within abstract work, but to announce it as queer is quite important moving forwards. And I think it is about making sure that I am mindful as an artist in the ways that I collaborate and seek to find humour as well in the ways that we are constantly asked to doubt ourselves if we are lesser or of a lower class. Um, so I think there's something around confidence in ownership of what others might seek to see as negative. Um, so there's certainly learning in that sense as to how it evolves artistically in the materials at the moment. I don't know. It's certainly been a sense of some digital interference has crept into the work. And then I explore how I deal with digital interference in still an analog um, hands on way of looking at placement and arrangement of that kind of information. So things like dating apps and distance between having normal relationships and behaviors and social encounters and how that manifests, I think is, I think we're at an exciting point as much as it's awful, but the fact that we are talking about such movements on a level of, you know, um, thinking about world peace and being acknowledged to that level of focus, I think is quite important and amazing and to be continued to support it as an ally, which is all yeah. I can ever be. Yeah. Um, just wanted to say that, you know, you're Blackpool born and bred, as far as I know. <laughs> yeah. um, and over the last few years, you have begun to develop uh, a wider national and international profile for your work. I just wondered how and is it important to you that you are based in Blackpool, that you're based in the Northwest? Does that inform um, your work? Um, has it impacted positively, negatively on your career development in any way? And how do you define your yourself as an artist? I'm always interested in that local versus the uh, international debate where artists define themselves and place themselves. Yeah, I think it's become increasingly important on the on most logical sense of I don't show signs of moving. <laughs> so even if I have ever thought about it, it never seems to be a decision that I implement and I still stay here. And it feels like there's work to be done. And I think an artist's prerogative is to always look at solutions to problems or always deal with the frustrations of what is lacking um, and make work as a result of that. So particularly for me, that becomes um, important. So I think I'm, I think I'm a reward for Blackpool rather than Blackpool rewards me. And that isn't about ego. It's about knowing that you are you are doing something as opposed to you, your situation is dictating the terms to you. Um, and I think that's maybe a decision in the, in the way that we think about local or not local in the way we classify ourselves creatively too. Um, I am based here, my origin is here and that is my provenance and that's important to me. But I seek to fight against that being something that dictates that I am of a lower class or a lower economic um, wealth bracket or things are unobtainable to me because the only reason they will be is because that's my own limiting beliefs rather than what anyone else will place on me. So it certainly is a nice reminder that it's, it's a beautiful place to live. It's problematic at the same time, but I think the nature of being a queer person in this world, it's proud and problematic all the time. So it seems the right destination to ponder on that and continue to work with those questions visually. Yeah. Oh, and that idea of, questions it, it leads us into the last question which is um you know kind of a big question really to leave until the end but I work a lot with emerging artists and um you know learning from them supporting them in the development of their work and one of the questions I get asked all the time is how do I progress my career how should I go about um seeking opportunities how should I um you know look at making it something that I'm able to do full time um, and it's a big question, but I just wondered, you know, can we leave on um, a piece of useful advice um, that you might give to an artist looking to progress their practice? Yeah, I think something I've experienced as an artist who also curates in the support of emerging artists as well, kind of aged 18 to 30 across the country. A lot of the time, it's art is within a, a wider conversation around the economy that they have and how they have to earn money. 
And sometimes artists are always at risk of discussing their practice as secondary to the other job that they have. And sometimes it's a mental flip reverse there in terms of you're an artist first, that's your primary goal and that's your priority. And your other job is your other job and it serves a purpose um, so that you can have the time to afford yourself to be the artist. So sometimes it's often a reminder because we get bogged down by the needs of paying bills versus the needs to stimulate ourselves professionally, creatively and look at the future because the present can often be so um, um, weighted and we forget to look beyond that. So for me, it's about saying to artists, if you wake up in the morning and the first thing you think about is making art, then make sure you reflect that in the way you introduce yourself as well. I think to tell people you're an artist as opposed to you do art on the side is a very subtle shift in your everyday. And I think that will work wonders in making sure that you improve your own belief in what you do. Yeah, I think that's a really great point to end on actually, Garth. So thank you, that idea of pronouncing yourself as an artist. I think it's really good. Thank um, you. So thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Um, and take care out there. Take care out there. <laughs> <laughs>